Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good. Nice to meet you. Uh, today, we'll be talking about advanced WordPress with uh, SEO and affiliate marketing. Um, like, like she said, my name is Brian Tai, and um, I'm the co-founder of BudgetYourTrip.com, uh, along with my wife, Laurie. Laurie and I uh, started BudgetYourTrip.com about 10 years ago. It's hard to believe. Um, and recently, we reached a milestone of having over 1 million monthly page views. Uh, that was before the pandemic, of course. And now our traffic is uh, significantly lower, um, but it's still doing okay. Um, I've been a software and website developer for over 20 years. Um, building websites has been a major part of my career. Um, I've built websites for small companies and large companies and government agencies. Um, I've built websites in WordPress and uh, Drupal and just, just straight up code such as PHP and Java and other languages. Um, I've built custom plugins and custom themes for WordPress. Um, and I've also, you know, learned a lot on my own about SEO and user interface design, content creation, uh, monetization, and things like that in order to make budget ship successful. So uh, in the last, you know, 10 years or so, I've gotten a lot into the, the marketing side of website development as well. Um, so today we're going to talk about SEO in WordPress and affiliate marketing in WordPress, um, as well as a number of helpful Word, WordPress plugins. Uh, we're also going to hit on a little bit of more about security and, and marketing and promotion. Um, this, this session, you know, is, is entitled Advanced WordPress because uh, we hope that you already have some knowledge of WordPress, such as, you know, hopefully you've already installed it and hopefully you've already, already been using it to, to build your website and create content and things like that. And, and hopefully you'll learn some more about, about some of the specific details about doing SEO and affiliate marketing in WordPress and, and learn some more about some of the, the great plugins that are out there. Because there's quite literally thousands of plugins for WordPress, it's hard to, to pick out which ones are, are the best and which ones are the best for your website. Um, so let's get started. We'll talk about first SEO, search engine optimization in WordPress. Um, but, um, so, but first let's talk about, you know, WordPress out of the box before we start getting into some of the plugins. So, you know, SEO in, in WordPress is not bad. Um, but you know, as you, as you know, if you're using WordPress, it, it gets better every year because the developers of WordPress are always updating everything. Um, just recently they, they released a, an update that included XML sitemaps into the core part of WordPress. This is something that previously you had to have a plugin to do um, and XML sitemaps are very important um, for SEO or, or just um, letting, letting Google find your, your website and all your content in general. Um, WordPress also does a really good job of giving you a good URL structure. Um, most plugins give you uh, mobile responsiveness, which is really good so that your, your website looks good on a mobile phone or mobile device. Um, they give you a, a really powerful tool for building out menus and categories and, and links uh, so that you can build out the structure of your website, which is also very important for SEO. Um, and most importantly, uh, WordPress lets you create the content really easily. And, and, and of course, content is the most important thing for, for any, any website for SEO. Um, and we'll get into some of that later as well. But can SEO and WordPress be improved? Yes, it can, as, as you will see. And I think as you probably, proof, proof is in that there's so many SEO plugins out there that, that do so much for WordPress, which is really good. So um, that being said, first, I wanna, I wanna cover a few myths about SEO and a few myths about SEO in WordPress specifically. Um, the first myth is that if you just install a plugin, then all of your, your content and all of your web, your entire website will just rank on the first page of Google. Um, a lot of people think, oh, if you just install like the Yoast plugin, for example, or, or another similar plugin, that you'll just, you'll just be up there. So, you know, oh, I, in I installed this plugin. So why isn't my website ranking on, on the first page? Um, the truth is that you have to have really good content in order to rank on Google. And that these plugins, they, they can help you, but they only do so much. And if you don't have good content, then, they can't make the content for you. They can't build backlinks for you. They can't do the really hard work for you that it takes to, to do well with SEO. Um, I know this because I've tried. <laughs> um, as a developer myself, sometimes my, my first instinct was to always just maybe write some code. If I can just write this little piece of code or install this other plugin um, and maybe try to take the easy way out of, of doing the hard part of SEO, then my website would just rank number one. And that, that just doesn't happen. It never happens. The only way to really get yourself as, as doing well with SEO is to have really good content. You have to have good content first. Um, the next myth is if you write a better post than the posts that are ranking above you, then you'll just reach the first page of Google or you'll, you'll get up to be to num number one in the search results. Um, writing good articles is extremely important, as I just said, but 
it's more than just having good content. You need to do lots of other things too. You need to have backlinks. You need to have lots of content around the same topic. Like this is known as, you know, being an authority site or having authority on a topic. So you can't just write one post about a topic. You need to write lots of posts about the topic so that Google sort of sees you as the authority on, on whatever the topic is. Um, you need to have internal links to the new post. And you also need a lot of patience because when you write a post, sometimes it could take months or even a year for it to get on the first page of Google. And unfortunately, that's really frustrating for a lot of people because they write a post and then three days later, they don't know why it's not on the first page. It's unfortunately, it just takes a long time. Myth number three, you know, my website has lots of backlinks, so I should be ranking at the top. Um, you do need a lot of backlinks in order to do well in SEO. But like I said before, there's many factors. You need good content. You need all those other things that I talked about before. So just having backlinks is not, is not the answer. Um, there are plugins that can sort of help you work out getting backlinks, but, um, but again, it's just, they, they don't always do the work for you. You still have to do the work yourself. The other point I want to make here is, um, a lot of people say, well, I have lots of backlinks, but how many backlinks is a lot of backlinks? You know, some people say, well, I, I, I reached out and I got five backlinks, whereas other people are getting maybe hundreds or maybe thousands of backlinks. And the concept of having lots of backlinks is relative and, and without using some sort of tool, um, we'll talk about some tools later, but without using some sort of tool, it can be really hard to know exactly how many backlinks you really need, especially when there's like a lot of other factors, which I mentioned earlier, you know, good content, internal links, having authority. So the point here that I really want to make is that there's no just one factor that drives up your SEO. It's a combination of lots of different things. And that's what you have to keep in mind. And that's what actually a lot of these plugins will do which we'll get to in a minute. So how do you rank higher on Google? Um, you need lots of content and the content should answer the user's query or question. When you think about it, every Google search is essentially a question. Even if the person only types in one word, like if they type in the word dishwasher, what they're really looking for there, what they're really asking is, hey, I need a dishwasher or where can I find a dishwasher or something like that. And your blog post or your article or your entire website should hopefully answer that question and answer that user's query. That's essentially how you get to be on the first page of Google is by answering that specific question and providing the user with an answer. Um, the title and header tags need to be relevant to the query, um, as does the, the entire content, all the, all the paragraphs of text that you write. Having lots of backlinks helps, having lots of internal links to the article helps. Um, Google is kind of a popularity contest. So having links lets Google know that your website is better than other people's websites because other human beings have linked to it and have said, this is the best website or this is the best page that answers that question, right? Um, you can control a lot of this in WordPress, but again, the plugins can't do everything for you. We'll get to that in a minute. I, I know I'm <laughs> repeating that over and over again because I really want to enforce that having good content and doing the hard part yourself is kind of the, the way you get you you do well in SEO and not necessarily like having the plugin do all the work for you, right? Most importantly, SEO is a long-term strategy. Nothing happens overnight. Like I said before, it takes months for pages to rank. It takes a long time to write content. It takes a long time to get the content, you know, highly ranked up on Google. So this is not a this is not a get rich quick scheme, right? A lot of people think they just put up a website and write a bunch of content and get some links and it happens really fast, but that's not true at all. Um, my wife and I have been doing our website for 10 years and it's just now kind of getting to the point where we can really say we've been successful. Um, so SEO, long-term strategy for sure. So I just want to define a few things here. If, if you start diving into SEO research um, and, and some of the SEO blogs that are out there, you'll probably see these two things talked about a lot. On-site SEO versus off-site SEO. Essentially on-site is everything that you do on your own site. Um, this is things like the, extra, the, the XML sitemap, internal links, your title tags, your meta tags, your schema markup to get rich snippets, other things you do to make your website fast, uh, your theme, the plugins you install, all the, all the code that's on your own website. Whereas offsite SEO are, are things that you do that are not on your website, but maybe on somebody else's website or maybe uh, social media and other marketing channels that you might use. Um, backlinks are very important. Everything you do with offsite SEO kind of essentially revolves around getting more links to your website. Because when you reach out to other people to get backlinks in different ways, such as with guest posting, or even when you advertise on social media, yeah, social media is a, is a way to get traffic on, on its own. But 
in a lot of ways, from an SEO standpoint, social media is about kind of getting backlinks. It's debatable whether or not social media channels such as Facebook or, or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that actually gives you link juice, but it's definitely true that it gets your name out there and maybe somebody else will link to it. If they see your, 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 your link or your post, then maybe they'll link to it. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do social media marketing because you should, but in a way it can sort of help from a secondhand point of view with your, with your SEO and just all general marketing and outreach that you do from an SEO standpoint, getting as many links as possible is always good for your, for your offsite SEO. Now, since we're talking about WordPress, we're going to be talking, everything we're going to talk about from now on is, is on-site SEO. These are all things that you do on your, on your own website. So just a few definitions here, you know, XML sitemaps, we'll get into some of this in a little bit, but they tell Google where your content can be found. Uh, your title, meta and header tags tell your, tell Google what your content is about. Um, internal links and breadcrumbs tell Google what's relevant to the content because if you link certain topics together, uh, this tells Google that all these pages are, are, are related in some form or another, or at least that's the ideal scenario. Um, schema markup is relatively new in the last couple of years. Uh, this helps you get rich snippets. We'll get into some of that in a minute too. And of course, you've probably heard of alt text in an image uh, that tells Google what an image is all about. Um, a lot of people leave alt alt text blank and it's not something you should do. You should definitely fill in the alt text because that can help you with an image search. So an XML sitemap, this is, this is something that's new in Google Core, you know, before you needed a plugin for this. Um, it's essentially a, a type of code. It's, it's kind of hard sometimes for a, a human to read it, but Google and other machine, you know, programs can read it very well. It's essentially just a language that tells Google where all your posts live. Um, and that's really important because as soon as you publish a post, WordPress will update your, your XML sitemap and then Google will read it periodically and then see, oh, you've published a new post. So, and schema markup and rich snippets. So schema markup is essentially a new type of uh, code structure that you can embed within your, your posts. Um, plugins will do this if you don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the code yourself. Um, and they make it so that Google can find out how your content is structured. So for example, if you have a recipe or if you have an event, or different types of articles might have different structures about them. And then Google will show in different formats. Maybe it's in a rich snippet, like the, the, the featured snippet at the top of search results or down below, you can see the examples here, like a recipe might have a rating and you can actually often see the steps of a recipe on the first page of Google. If you have a, a recipe that, that follows the rich snippet structure, um, you can see event information like dates and times of events and things like that. Uh, this can be a really powerful tool to help people click on your website or to get the information they need that will drive more traffic. It's sort of like a, a competition kind of thing where if your, if your link on the first page of Google looks better than other pages links, then maybe people are more tempted to click on it. Um, that being said, just because you use a schema markup and, and get a rich snippet does not mean that you'll be on the first page of Google. So you know, there's a lot of debate there about whether or not this helps you rank, but definitely helps you get more clicks, I think, um, in my own experience. So let's talk about links real quick. Um, sometimes people get confused with well, all these words talking about links. Internal links are links within your own website. So one of your posts linking to another one of your posts. Backlinks are links from other websites to your website. And external links are links from your own posts that link out to other websites. So if you're reading a lot of... Um, SEO blogs and trying to do your own research, you'll see people refer to these terms and, and sometimes it gets a little confusing, especially backlinks and external links. So I just wanted to clarify that so that you guys understand like what people are talking about is maybe you do further research into SEO. Um, like I said, backlinks are really important. Getting other people to link to your website is really important. Um, but we're going to talk about internal links a lot in a little bit as well, uh, because they can be very important, be a very powerful tool that you can control yourself to hopefully boost up uh, different pages on your site. Okay, so let's get into the, the good stuff, the SEO plugins. I'm sure if you've, if you've tried to, to dive into SEO in WordPress, you've heard of Yoast. Yoast has been the most popular SEO plugin um, for a variety of reasons. First of all, it was one of the first plugins to do a little bit of everything all in one plugin. And that's kind of what it does. It lets you edit your title tags, your meta tags, your description tags, your social media images, it does image redirects, it can do schema markup, it can, you can stick a keyword in there and it can tell you if your post, uh, you know, does well with that keyword and things like that. Um, it has this concept of the green light. I'm sure a lot of people have seen that where when you write up something, 
you write up a blog post and it tells you, it either gives you a red, yellow, or green light, kind of like a traffic light. And if, and if it fits in with a certain algorithm, then you get the green light, right? So this is all, these are all things that have driven Yoast to be one of the most popular plugins, the, probably the most popular plugin out there um, for SEO. Um, but honestly, I don't know if it really should be because a lot of other plugins are coming up behind it and doing some really amazing things. Also, Yoast now has a, a pro plan, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the, the pro plan or the, the paid premium plan, um, it costs money and it does a lot of good things, but you might not need it and you might need it. But some of those features in that paid plan are free in other plugins, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, one myth that I do want to talk about is this idea of the green light. A lot of people, I've seen a lot of people post on the different, you know, Facebook groups and, and SEO forums and stuff that, you know, I got the green light. I, I wrote a post and, it, and Yoast gave me the green light. So why isn't it ranking on the first page of Google or why isn't it ranking number one? Uh, you need to understand that this green light really is just a, a quick computer algorithm that says, okay, you're using the keyword in your title. You're using the keyword in your headers. You're using the keyword, you know, 8% of the time or, or whatever percent of the time throughout your, your, your post. Uh, you have an image and you have some other media in there. And if you sort of like check those boxes, then you'll get the green light. And while you should generally try to check those boxes, that doesn't mean that you're gonna rank number one in Google because like I said before, there's so many factors. And it also doesn't mean that your content is really good because you can write really bad content that still checks all the boxes and gives you a green light. And you don't necessarily you know, want to have bad content just because it checks all the boxes. I've ranked posts number one that have gotten a red light before. And I've written plenty of posts that have gotten a green light that have done very poorly. So use the green light as a guide as a suggestion, but not as like the Bible as to whether or not your post is going to rank. Again, these, these plugins are kind of meant to be sort of tools of convenience, right? So the Yoast premium plan, should you use this? I mean, I don't know. A lot of people say everybody should, but a lot of people say nobody should. I think I'm going to actually suggest another plugin in a minute. Um, the premium or paid version of, of Yoast gives you the ability to add multiple keywords to a post. And all that really does is just sort of check that you're, that you're sort of using that keyword throughout your post. It doesn't, actually, it doesn't actually do anything for Google. A lot of people think they put the, the keyword in there and now that their, their post will rank for that keyword, but that's not how it works. The keyword that you stick into Yoast and the keyword that you stick into some of the other plugins I'll talk about in a minute, is really just to, to have the algorithm check the keyword against your content to see if you're using it enough or, or not. Um, the premium version of Yoast gives you more schema.org, more schema rich snippet options. Like if you're using, if you have a recipe blog or, or different types of content, events and things like that. Um, you should probably only really use this if you have a, a, a type of site that would need one of these rich snippets. Um, it gives you better social media previews. It gives you more internal link suggestions. Uh, it gives you a redirect manager. Um, there's actually free plugins for all those things. So you don't necessarily need to pay for the Yoast plugin. I actually don't recommend Yoast at all. I actually recommend this other plugin called Rank Math. Rank Math does pretty much everything Yoast does. It just, in my opinion, it does it either better or the features are free. Um, it's fairly new. I think this is going to be the number one SEO plugin in maybe in a couple of years, um, mainly because it's doing an amazing job with, with features and ease of use. It's really easy to use. Um, it does basically all the same things that Yoast does. I just think it does them in a, in a more easy to use way. It does them better. And some of the features it gives you are free, whereas Yoast makes you pay for them. One of those features is um, the ability to have multiple keywords that it kind of tests you against in, in, in your post. Um, you can see in my little screenshot here on the right, um, the focus keyword there in the middle, I've written Paris, and then the other one I've written Eiffel Tower. And you can see it gives you a I've got the score there up to the top of 76 out of 100. So it's giving me a yellow score instead of a green score. It's kind of the same idea as Yoast's uh, red, yellow, green traffic light system. It's basically the same idea um, where it sort of runs you through a checklist. You can kind of see there at the bottom of the screenshot. It says, hey, you're using your focus keyword in the title. That's good. Again, it's running through you through an algorithm. This is not something that's just going to immediately make you rank for that keyword. You have to sort of do that work yourself and do the idea of, of coming up with all the good content yourself. Um, that being said, this is a really great plugin because the developers are working on this a lot. They are soon coming out with a premium version. Right now, everything is free and everything 
you get in this plugin is free, but they are coming out with a, a premium version, a paid version sometime in the next few months. Uh, they have yet to announce what will actually be in there, but they've hinted that there's probably going to be a few more uh, schema markup, rich snippet options and things like that. Kind of the similar stuff that you see in Yoast. That being said, everything in here, all the, all the features that you see on the plugin now are free. Um, and so that's really great. And there's a lot of free things in there that, like I said, that, that Yoast makes you pay for. So I really recommend this one. It also can import all your data from Yoast if you're already using Yoast. Um, there's a lot of other sort of quote, do everything SEO plugins that are where, where the plugin basically has a whole bunch of tools just like Yoast and, and Rank Math. All in one SEO pack, the SEO framework, Slim SEO, these all essentially do the same thing. So if you're not happy with Yoast or Rank Math, there's lots of other options out there. You can check them out, you know, try them out all you want. Um, they all kind of do similar things, right? So if you don't want to have one of those all in one plugins, you can try to sort of do it piecemeal. There's a lot of little plugins out there. Um, and often like if you find that um, one of those other plugins has a paid version such as Yoast that makes you pay for a particular feature, you can probably find a small free plugin that might do that feature for you. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, schema markup rich snippet plugins out there that might fulfill your need if you don't wanna pay for Yoast. But for example, if you just want a, a plugin that lets you modify the title tag for SEO purposes or manage your meta tags or something like that, there's a bunch of little plugins out there. Um, if you have a new site and you're, or, or even like a, a mid-level site where you're growing, if you don't have sort of that, that niche need for one of these specific small plugins, I would recommend that you go ahead and use like one of the, the, the do everything plugins such as Rank Math. Um, I think everything that Rank Math gives you and Yoast as well is, is really great. Uh, you know, it scans your website, tells you what to do. Um, it tells you how to, how to configure your website better. Um, whereas some of these smaller plugins, they're not gonna give you that sort of that all in one package that, that those big plugins do. Um, so that's what I would recommend if you have a new site, if you're starting with a brand new site, yeah, just install Rank Math and, and then do what it says, follow its suggestions as you write some really good content. Okay, internal link building. Um, Internal links essentially let you build authority around particular topics. So let's say, you know, this is travel. So we're talking about, uh, let's try use an example of, of Paris, for example. Maybe I have a, a post about Paris and then I have, and then I write another post about Paris and then another post about Paris. I want all these posts to link together so that I can sort of build authority around the, the topic of Paris um, because maybe I have something about hotels or something about restaurants and something about activities and tours and things to do and things like that, right? So I wanna have all my, Paris posts link together, well, the, these links will be known as internal links and they let Google know that, that, that all these links, that all these posts are related. And one way to do that is through categories or tags because we can have like a category of, we can have the category of Paris where everything in Paris would show up on, on your category page, for example. But ideally what we want is to have links within the content. Um, this lets Google know that particular concepts are related. So if I'm talking about hotels in Paris and then maybe I mention restaurants in Paris, well, the, the term restaurants in Paris is a perfect place to link to a blog post about restaurants in Paris. And that lets Google know not just that that other post exists, but that that other post is about the words in the link because the words in the link are a big indicator to Google that the other post is about this particular topic with these particular keywords. Right, so um, there's a number of plugins to help with all this. There's one called Yarp or yet another related post plugin. This essentially puts uh, links at the bottom of a post. It's really easy to use. Um, you can configure it by categories or tags. So if you tag all your posts with Paris, then it will show you know, all the, all the links to other Paris posts and things like that. There's another one called inline related posts, which I really like. It makes links that look like this one, like this yellow link here. Um, you can configure the colors and everything like that. And so it makes it a nice good call out, not just for Google, but for, for actual human beings reading your post to say, oh, if you like this post about Paris, then, you know, it'll automatically pull up links to your other posts within the same category or that have the same tags or, or some combination thereof. Um, so that's a really nice way to say, Hey, look, there's some, some stuff that you might want to read here. There are others too. I, I'm a big fan of automation because, you know, I'm a computer programmer by trade. So automation is something that I always look for so that you have to do like less manual work. And there's some posts, some, sorry, some plugins that let you kind of automatically create internal links. Um, 
internal links juicer, internal links manager, link whisper, and SEO smart links. They all, all four of these plugins, and there's a few others out there, but all four of these plugins essentially do the same thing where you basically set a keyword, like say the word is Paris, and anytime in one of your posts, if WordPress sees the word Paris, then it will automatically make a link to a post about Paris on your site. And so what you can do is basically insert a whole bunch of keywords with their related posts on your site, and then it will automatically fill in a bunch of internal links for you. And there's usually a bunch of sort of like rules and settings around these plugins so that you don't have, you don't have too many links, right? You don't want, you don't want every other word to be a link, but maybe if you have a handful of links throughout your posts, they're all related to, to similar things based on the keywords, then you can imagine the power here. If you have a hundred posts, you don't have to do this manually. You can essentially just turn on these plugins, add all the keywords in, and then WordPress will just sort of fill in the links for you. So all of a sudden every post has what, maybe three to five internal links going to other posts. And then you create this giant spider web of links, right? Where all these posts are linked together. Um, in my experience, I've seen posts do much better on Google after creating a bunch of internal links to them. I've had posts that I created maybe like one link to it, like in a category or a menu or something. And it did, it did okay or not so well on, on Google search results. And then I've added like 10 or even 15 or 20 internal links from the rest of the website to that one post. And that sort of says to Google, hey, this post is important. And this post is about these topics because those, those keywords in the link are important too. And I've seen that, that post go up in the rankings, um, often to the first page. So internal links can, can be a really powerful tool. I think it's one of the most underrated tools in SEO. Um, I think it's not quite as powerful as backlinks from other websites, but it is a really important tool and it can, you can kind of see significant improvement. If you are trying to get one or two particular posts to go up and you make all of your other posts link to them to say, hey, this is an important post, especially if those links are relevant about the topic. Um, that can be a really powerful tool. Now, if you do this with all of your posts, then Google kind of sees them all as all as even and or equal, right? Or on the same level. And so it's not going to work if you just link to all of them. You have to sort of pick and choose some. You have to sort of think about that concept of like a like a a corner a piece of cornerstone content or a, or a content silo or an authority page or something like that. There's a lot of there's a lot of terms to describe the same content. It's the same concept of where you have an item of content that is sort of seen as the important piece of content for that particular topic, right? Internal links are a great way to build that, that concept. All right, so real quick, I wanna talk about website speed. A lot of people say that website speed is extremely important for SEO. Um, website speed can be important for SEO. I see a lot of people on some of these new blogger groups on Facebook and things like that, really really diving into to website speed and trying to make their, their speed get faster. I've seen a lot of people get really frustrated though because they they write five or ten posts and then they say, oh, I need to spend a lot of time on my website speed. And then they spend maybe like a month working on it or they even hire somebody to work on it. They pay a lot of money to have somebody work on their website speed. Whereas the truth is what you really need to do is focus on more content. I don't think you should really look at website speed unless you have a much larger website that is doing much better from a traffic standpoint, if your website speed is kind of in the middle, then, then you're gonna be okay until you create a lot more content. The best way to get better rankings on Google is to create more content. I've seen too many people bang their head against the wall with speed when they should be focusing on content. That being said, once you have sort of a mid-level blog with a lot more posts and things like that, you can start to, to focus on speed. Um, speed is important for SEO, but it's not the only factor. And I see so many people just focusing on speed when they need to focus on content, okay? So that's what I'm trying to say. Um, there are some, some good plugins out there that you can install that will help boost your speed. Um, we'll talk about some in a minute. Your theme can impact your speed more than you realize. Some themes have just so much code and so much bloated extra stuff with them that it really can slow down your site. Um, if, you, if you Google, you know, WordPress themes that are, that are faster or that with a faster page loading speed and things like that, you'll get some good suggestions. Um, there are some plugins which can slow down your site, especially plugins which load stuff onto the uh, the published side of WordPress. Not not the plugins that load into the dashboard, but the plugins that actually show things out on the on the front of your page. That some of those can slow down your site. Your web host and your server might be affecting your speed. Um, if you went with a really cheap budget uh, server plan, 
then your website is probably on the same server as like 5,000 other websites. And this can be a little slow. If you upgrade your hosting plan, sometimes you should probably do some research into this as to which hosting plan you're using. But often, basically, if, if the computer your website is on is faster, then it will often load faster, which can help your speed. Um, you can test your page speed using Google's Page Speed Insights website or GT Metrics. There's a few others out there. Kind of just test with all of them, see what they say. Most of these websites give you suggestions as to how to improve your site speed. Um, a lot of those suggestions are, are, are quite technical, so you might need to ask for help or something like that. Uh, but sometimes just switching out and experimenting with different themes can help. Um, website speed plugin. So there's, there's a few out there that can really help. WP Supercache, perhaps the easiest thing you can install. Um, it basically makes your pages load faster by, by caching them on the server. Because essentially what happens in, in WordPress is when somebody visits your website, if they visit a particular web, a particular post, this, the WordPress system goes back to the database, grabs all the content, shoves that content into a template, and then publishes that template instantaneously to the user who just requested it. And so this is kind of a slow process and it happens over and over again, the more traffic you get. Um, so basically what this, the Supercache plugin does is the first time somebody loads the page, it generates the entire web page and saves it on the server. So the next person and the next 5,000 people that visit, they just get the quick already generated version of the page. Um, and it can also squish up some of the other code that's on the page so that it loads faster as well. Um, and just by installing this one plugin, you can see significant improvements really quickly. Uh, so I recommend you do that. There's a few other plugins, auto-optimize and async JavaScript that can, that can speed up your site. Again, if you're a new blogger, just installing these plugins can make a significant difference. Um, if you're like a mid-level blogger that I, I still recommend you focus on content. Content is the number one thing that you can add to your site to get better SEO rankings. So yeah, spend some time with speed. Don't bang your head against the wall. Don't spend too much time or you're wasting your time when you should be adding more content. But yeah, install these plugins and you should, you should see some improvement. Don't focus on too much speed until, until later. So um, that being said, a CDN, you've probably heard of this too. This can help your, your, your website speed. A CDN is basically a content delivery network. And so what this does is essentially, I've got, a, I've got an image here. Instead of your, your website being on one server, essentially what it does is it pushes your, your website out to servers around the world so that if somebody on the other side of the world visits your website, the connection doesn't have to go all the way back around the world, get the website and then push it all the way back to them. Instead, it finds a server that's, that's a lot closer. And so in theory, this gives you a much faster connection and a much faster page loading speed for that, for that particular user. Um, I only recommend this for larger, well-established websites. And why is that? Well, one, sometimes these CDNs, they're not free. Sometimes they're not always faster because there's a lot of companies out there that kind of do some shady stuff and they charge you money, but don't always deliver on their promises. Um, I've also seen a whole lot of people with a whole lot of problems and broken websites and, and long calls with tech support and people whose, whose websites just don't work for months at a time because they tried to install a CDN. Um, it can be a bit of a, of a technical hurdle unless you hire somebody to do it for you. And even if you hire somebody to do it for you, the results are not always good. So in theory, a CDN is a great thing to do. In practice, it can cause a lot of problems. So this is something else where I suggest more content instead of spending a whole lot of time on this. If you have a mid-level to high-level website, look into it. But if you have a new website, don't bother with this until much later in your, in your blogging career, okay? This is one of those things where you might bite off more than you can chew and it can lead to a lot of problems and a lot of headaches. So WordPress SEO, in summary, focus on content, focus on getting backlinks. Um, I suggest everybody install Rank Math if they're not already using a plugin that they're happy with. Um, look into creating internal links, especially internal links around a page that you want to rank well as like an authority page. Um, install the basic speed plugins. Uh, again, focus on content. I mentioned that again because content is the most important thing. Um, the technical stuff only gets you so far, right? So focusing on content is the best thing you can do. And I know that I, I might sound like I'm beating a dead horse there and repeating myself over and over again, but I've seen so many new bloggers and I've seen so many new 
uh, website creators, whether they're a new blogger or whether they're like me, like a, a computer programmer or a software developer, a lot of people try to take sort of the, the shortcuts. They think, oh, I can just install a plugin or I can use some sort of code or programming to, to get my rankings higher on Google. It does not work like that. Trust me, I've, I've done it. I've been there. I've seen a lot of other people try to do it. The, the real way to, to do well on SEO is to put in the work of doing research into good content and good keywords, right? And I think any, any SEO expert will tell you that. There's no shortcuts to getting number one on Google. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about affiliate marketing in WordPress. Um, first, just like we had a few myths about SEO, let's talk about some myths about affiliate marketing. Um, if you just put affiliate links, Oh, first of all, I just want to make sure everybody understands what affiliate links are before we get started, just in case there's any, any beginners out there. You know, affiliate links are, are links where if you link from somebody clicks from your website to another website and then they purchase something, then you get some sort of commission, right? And so I think everybody knows what that is, given that this is the um, Travel Payouts Affiliate Summit, right? So um, that being said, affiliate marketing myths, if you just put some links on your website, on your pages, then you'll make money because people will click and then they'll buy stuff, right? Um, yes, while it is easy to put the links on your pages, uh, it's not always easy to make money from them because, uh, you know, not every individual consumer out there, every individual visitor to your website is interested in purchasing something. And so we'll talk about some strategies for maximizing that in a little bit. Um, or another myth is just use Amazon because it's the largest program out there in the world and it's the easiest to use because you just put links to products that have to do with the topic of your pages. Um, people will just buy stuff after clicking on your links or affiliate marketing requires no effort at all, right? So I think that a lot of people get tempted into affiliate marketing because it seems like it requires no effort. It seems like you just have to put the links on there and that takes like 30 seconds to add a few links here and there, um, especially with some of the tools I'm gonna show you in a minute. But you actually do need to do some work and some research and put some thought into it around the content if you want to do well with it. Um, the truth is you need to figure out what motivates buyers around a particular product or service and then plan accordingly for your content. Um, you need to align your affiliate programs with your content and you need to align your content with your affiliate programs. Um, in my opinion, SEO is the best way to attract motivated visitors, um, but it's not the only way. Plenty of people use social media, plenty of people use email newsletters or other types of things. But for, for, for my thoughts, you know, we've done well with SEO and it's mainly because of this. If you have a blog post about dishwashers and you post that on Facebook um, to your audience, even if you have 100,000 people liking your page on Facebook and they see something about a dishwasher, well, if they're not interested in buying a dishwasher right there, then they're probably just gonna scroll on through and not, not ever click your link, right? But the person who's interested in buying a dishwasher that person is going to Google dishwashers. And so somebody who Googles dishwashers is gonna be in the mindset to actually purchase a dishwasher. And so if they land on your page through SEO, then you're much more likely to get a conversion or a purchase from that link. And that's why I think SEO is the better way um, because people who are in the mindset to buy something are the people who are Googling things. Um, SEO, or sorry, affiliate marketing is, is kind of like dependent on a lot of traffic sometimes because it's often about sort of statistics and playing the odds. Like to earn a commission, you may get a hundred or a thousand people to visit your page, but only a certain percentage of those are going to click the link. And then only a certain percentage of those people are gonna buy something. Um, so I've got an example here. If a hundred people visit your page and 20% click a link, so that's 20 people. And 20% of those people actually buy something. So now that's four people. And if your average commission is about $10, depending on kind of what you're selling, um, that's $40, right? Well, so you basically made $40 off of 100 people. But $40, you know, if you're a new blogger, it might seem like, wow, I made $40 and I just put some links on my site. But $40 is not really enough to make a living, right? If you want to make a living, you need to get your money up into hundreds and thousands of dollars a month, right? Um, and so that means you need lots of traffic, right, in order to sort of play those odds. And you either need lots of traffic or a large social media following that, that converts well or a large uh, email newsletter following that converts well too. 
Um, but that being said, once if you do have a lot of traffic, it can be easy to capitalize on it. And if you play the SEO game well, then you can you can capitalize on your traffic well as also. Um, Click through rates. Also, seen uh, if you if you look at a lot of like SEO blogs, you'll see the concept of CTR. That means click through rate. And purchasing rates, also referred to as conversions, uh, can vary greatly depending on your your website, your how you get your traffic, the products you sell, and things like that. Um, just thinking about the travel industry, you know, long term tours. Like, there's a lot of companies out there that. You know, you've heard of Trafalgar and G Adventures and these in these tour companies where you know you book a, a seven day or a fourteen day tour, things like that. Um, those tours are really expensive. So if you think about a family of three and each person is going to pay three to four thousand dollars for a tour, you're looking at like a ten thousand dollar package. Um, not as many people are going to purchase that. But if they do purchase that, then maybe you get a big commission, right? On the flip side. Uh, hotels and flights. Well, every time somebody travels, they're going to book a hotel or flight. So the, the conversion rates for those are a lot higher, but the commissions are a lot lower because there's like a much higher volume there. So these are all kind of things to think about is like, as you sort of plan your content and plan your structure of like all your affiliate programs is who's booking, how many bookings do you think you, you might get based on the amount of traffic you get? And, and what kind of programs do you wanna use on your site based on your audience and your traffic? Um, my website, you know, Lori and I's website personally has, has often catered to budget travelers. So we kind of look into low cost things, mainly because we know our audience is interested in low cost types of things. Whereas if we put like luxurious tours on our website, our audience would not would not resonate with that. They would probably not book that, right? Whereas if you had a luxury travel blog, maybe your audience would do that. But if you put links to say hostels on your luxury travel blog, your audience probably would not like that and would not book that kind of thing, right? So it just depends on your audience and, and what you're going for. So let's talk about some affiliate marketing plugins. Um, there's two particular plugins that kind of do the same thing that I really like. Easy affiliate links, is one and thirsty affiliates is another. Essentially what these do is they help you organize all of your affiliate links. Um, you, this is a screenshot of easy affiliate links, by the way. Basically what you do is you you click the link and you you create a link, you, you stick in your affiliate link and then what it can do is it has a number of options. It can cloak the affiliate link or, or not. It can open the link in a new tab. It can mark it as rel equals sponsored, which you've probably heard is important for a lot of affiliate links these days, depending on you know, which SEO rules you're following. Um, but generally what it does is it helps you organize it. And also what it can do is it can, um, you can tag it with a keyword. So like, again, tagging something with Paris, for example, maybe you want the affiliate links to be automatically included through your post. So anytime it sees the word Paris, it might link out to a particular hotel in Paris or something like that, right? So this is also useful because like that example with a hotel in Paris, maybe if you want to suggest a different hotel in Paris, you can just come into this tool and change the link in one place. And then that link will be changed everywhere in your website. So it can really help you kind of like manage the links if you need to change them out. Like if you change from one hotel booking program to another hotel booking program, you want to keep the same hotels, but you want to switch them to a different website, like maybe go from booking.com to hotels.com or something like that. You can just switch them here in one place. And then everywhere in your website, all the links will up update automatically. Um, they also let you import and export with spreadsheets, uh, which can be really helpful if you have hundreds of affiliate links that you want to add in, right? So there's lots of useful tools in, in these two programs. Uh, both of these plugins have uh, paid pro premium versions, whatever you want to call it, that you have to pay extra for. Um, you know, you can look at those and, and use them if you want. I think just getting started with the free the free version of either one is a really good idea. Um, for you guys listening, um, the Thirsty Affiliates people have given us a discount code. Uh, if you use the code Travel Payouts by October 18th, you can have a $60 discount on um, the pro version, the premium version of uh, the Thirsty Affiliates um, plugin. So that's something they've done that's nice for us and for our, our listeners. Um, there's lots more affiliate marketing related plugins out there. Of course, Travel Payouts has a plugin, which lets you add lots of different links um, and widgets. Um, Get Your Guide has a really cool affiliate, a really cool WordPress plugin that adds a widget. You've probably seen the Get Your Guide widgets in there where it shows different tours related to whatever keyword you want. So if you, if you put Paris, it'll show you Paris tours, um, things like that. Um, there's a lot of plugins for Amazon. 
uh, for example, and various other like big kind of popular popular um, affiliate programs. Um, that being said, outside of outside of WordPress plugins. I'm sure you've seen all the widgets that out that are out there. A lot of companies have widgets that you can easily insert into your content editor. Um, so sometimes you don't even need a you don't even really need a, a an actual plugin in WordPress. You can just copy and paste the code. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot of debate out there as to whether a widget is better or whether an inline link in in the text of your content is better. I think that that's something that everybody should test for themselves um, because personally, I've seen a lot of blog posts that are written in a certain way do well with inline links. And I've seen a lot of other blog posts or a lot of other pages that do well with widgets. Um, I think it depends on the format. It depends on the type of people that are, the type of audience that's coming in to look at it, how you acquire the audience, like through SEO or other means. Um, so this is something you should all test with your own audience. Um, it doesn't hurt to try both, but make sure you, if you can, a lot of um, the affiliate programs let you tag your links with some sort of code at the end to say, Okay, well, this link to a hotel came from, you know, link number five, and this one came from link number seven, and to see, like, well, which, which one did better with my audience, which one got more clicks, and which one got more conversions, and so you can do a little test like that. Um, a few more essential plugins. Google Analytics. I'm sure by now everybody who's got a website knows what Google Analytics is. If you don't, you really should. It lets you track your traffic. It lets you track where your traffic is coming from. Um, if you can't measure your traffic, then you don't know what's working well and what's not working well. Um, you need to understand the growth of your website, the growth of individual pages, where your traffic for individual pages is coming from, whether it's coming from Google or social media or whatnot. You can see which pages are doing well and which pages are doing poorly, or maybe which pages you need to kind of boost, right? Um, there's a lot of plugins that can, can let you use Google Analytics directly in WordPress. Some of the plugins are really basic and they let you just stick the Google Analytics code into your, um, into your website so that you can track it and then go to the Google Analytics website to look at all the charts and graphs, right? But some of them like Monster Insights and Analytify, they actually import the, the graphs directly into your WordPress dashboard. So maybe this is something you wanna use to look at your traffic within WordPress. Um, some of those other plugins too, like Monster Insights, they let you track outbound clicks. So if you want to see how many people are clicking out from your website, say to an affiliate marketing link or something like that, you can set those events up as well. If you don't use a plugin for this, then you're looking at using custom code. And if you're not a, a programmer, that can be really tricky to do. So it can be a really useful tool um, to use something like that to see how many people are clicking out to try to figure out how many clicks you're getting for each affiliate, affiliate link and things like that. Um, the redirection plugin, this is really powerful. This is kind of a behind the scenes thing. Um, basically what this plugin does, and by the way, this functionality exists in rank math already and some of the other all-in-one SEO plugins. Um, but basically what redirection can do is it can basically set up redirects automatically from one page to another page. It can find broken links on your site and then redirect them. It can find 404s, which are, which are like errors. So if somebody comes into your website and they they think a post is gonna be there, maybe you moved a post or deleted a post, then that person would get a 404 error or a page not found error. Well, the redirection plugin can find that, see it, and then you could redirect that URL to another related post. So if you deleted one of your Paris posts, it could automatically redirect to one of your other Paris posts, for example. Um, you could do a site-wide redirect. You know, a lot of people talk about the best URL structure. A lot of times when new bloggers start their, their um, their site, they, they leave the, the dates, like where their, their post has like the year slash the month slash and then the title of their post. Um, and then they decide to get rid of the year and the month. Well, this requires a lot of redirects, but the redirection plugin can handle that for you automatically so that this whole, that whole process can take like three minutes instead of hours and hours, right? Um, like I said, Yoast and Rank Math. Yoast does this in its premium version. Rank Math does this for free. Um, if you don't want to use those plugins and just want to use this. It's really powerful and easy to use. Um, I think I've had sites where I've had both things set up uh, because the, the redirection plugin actually has a number of really good tools that some of the SEO plugins don't always have, uh, but it's really powerful. Um, ad inserter and advanced ads. Those are, those are two different plugins that essentially do the same thing. Basically what they let you do is insert code snippets throughout your blog posts. And of course, those code snippets are most useful for inserting ads. Um, 
a lot of ad programs these days, they have setups where they can kind of just, you just put one thing of code on your page and then they take over and they insert the ads automatically based on what their algorithms decide. Um, if you're doing that, then you don't need one of these plugins. But if you want to place the ads manually in specific places throughout your website, then you should probably use one of these plugins because it makes it really easy. So basically what you do is you just go into the, to the dashboard of this plugin and you say, okay, I want to create a new ad and you stick in the ad code and then you can stick the ad code anywhere you want. But often they also have tools to say, okay, I want to you know, use some rules here and say on my blog post, after every fifth paragraph, I want to stick an ad or I want to stick. And, and sometimes the rules can get a little more complicated, like after every fifth paragraph, that's not an image so that you don't have an ad right next to an image or you don't have an ad right after a, a header. So you don't have that weird situation where you have a header and then an ad and then a paragraph. And so the, the, the rules can get really complex and really, really nice and convenient for you. Um, I think that this is a great idea. Anybody who's using ads and who wants to kind of control their ads, both of these plugins are, are really well done. Um, security basics. Um, I just wanted to mention some stuff about security because a lot of people do sometimes, unfortunately, get hacked. They get their WordPress website or hacked or, or their, or their, their back end hacked or something like that. Um, WordPress is the most popular web publishing platform on the internet. Um, and so that means it's the number one target for any hacker, because if an exploit is found, any hacker can basically say, okay, well now <laughs> there's literally 10 million websites that I know how to hack because we found this one exploit, right? So in order to prevent that from happening to you, always keep your WordPress uh, version updated to the newest version. Um, there's really no reason not to. A lot of times people think, oh, well, I want to keep this old version because it has this feature. All those features exist in the new versions too. Um, always keep your plugins and your themes updated. Delete the themes and the plugins that are not being used. So it's not just enough to turn them off or to deactivate them. If you think you're just done with a plugin or a theme completely, just delete it entirely. Um, it used to be that you had to go into your control panel or whatnot to delete those, th those plugins and themes, but you don't have to do that anymore. Now it's just all through WordPress. You'll see the little red delete link. Um, so it's super easy to do. Use the WordFence plugin. It's a really cool plugin that kind of monitors the security on your site. Um, sometimes it can provide you with some really sort of scary warnings. Um, don't be scared by it. Just know that, you know, a lot of times WordFence is, is doing what it's supposed to do, right? Um, also, WordPress has a built-in site health page. You should check that out every now and then, especially through some of the security stuff that's on there and do what it tells you to do. Um, Akismet is a great plugin to manage spam comments. Uh, spam isn't always like, you know, just because somebody posts spam, it doesn't mean they're trying to hack into your site. Basically, they're just trying to get a, a link from your site to their site. Um, but Akismet is a great way to, to filter out a lot of those spam comments, especially because a lot of them are, are kind of seedy and have foul language or other topics that you don't want on your website, right? Um, one of the biggest things that you can do is to never let anybody have an account on your, on your WordPress you know, admin page, unless you know them personally. A lot of times people will give accounts to guest bloggers. Um, so the guest blogger can come in and, and post the, 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 the guest blog post automatically without, you know, you having to deal with it. Um, I don't recommend you do this at all, unless you, unless that person's a good friend of yours. Um, too many times, you know, this, the guest bloggers are just, and I'm not saying all guest bloggers do this. This, this is probably a 0.01% of the time situation, but sometimes there are CD people out there who are just trying to get in to, to hack your website, right? So just have the person send you the guest post in a, in a Google doc or a, a Word doc or something and post it yourself, right? Just eliminate the possibility of somebody hacking into your website. And also if there's, if there's more accounts created out there, you know, somebody might be able to, to figure out that guest blogger's username and password. And so it's one less account that somebody could try to figure out, right? Um, make sure your web host is doing regular backups or do them yourself because you want to have a backup in case something bad happens. Um, most web hosts do backups like every 24 hours or at least once a week. They back up your database and they back up your code and that's good. So if something goes wrong, you just call them and tell them to restore the backup. Uh, just do a little research into your hosting plan to see if they're doing this. If not, then ask them to do it or figure out a way to do it yourself. There's actually WordPress plugins that do this. I won't go into all the details, but you can do some research and, and figure it out if you, if you need to. 
So marketing and promotion of your website and WordPress, um, social media plugins. I'm sure that you're probably using a social media plugin, just like in the screenshot here, this one runs the icons down the left side of the screen. There's a million options for these, right? Going back to security, it seems like some social media plugins in the last few years have been the target of hackers. Do some research into the social media plugin you choose, find out if it's been hacked lately. If the social media plugin has been hacked, this is a sign, not that there's a security problem, but it's rather a sign that, that the creators of that plugin are trying to do so much and they're writing so much code that, that maybe they don't need to. Maybe you just need a more simple social media plugin because ultimately the code to load icons on the screen should not be so complicated that somebody should hack it. That's my opinion as a, as a software developer, right? If somebody can hack it, it means that the code is really complicated and perhaps it's too complicated for just some social media icons. Uh, that being said, I like Sassy, Social Share, and Ultimately Social. There's also a lot of automated plugins like Blog to Social and Revive Old Post. And basically what they do is like, like Revive Old Post, like maybe once a week or, or however you set it up, it'll take a, an old post from the last year or, or two years or however much time you want, and it'll stick it up on your social media. So it's a good way to sort of get people re-engaged with older content that you may have. It's a good way to not have to do all the manual work of posting to social media all the time because your system is automatically doing it for you. Um, email newsletter plugins. Email marketing is, is really powerful, especially if you can build like a good email newsletter list, a subscriber list. Um, there's a whole bunch of services out there. I'm sure you've all heard of them. There's, there's MailChimp and Constant Contact. And uh, I mean, I can't even name them all because there's like probably a good dozen that all do really good things. But I wanted to sort of like name a few that are in WordPress that are pretty cool. Um, there's one called the Newsletter Plugin and there's another one called MailPoet. And basically what these do is they let you create the email newsletters within your um, WordPress you know, system and then send out the emails. Um, both of these, in order for them to be really effective, if you have more than a couple hundred subscribers, you need to set them up with an external email service. Um, Amazon Web Services has a really affordable uh, email sending service and MailPoet does, does too. So that these can actually be a lot more affordable than some of the uh, email systems out there once you, once you build up a large subscriber list. Um, for example, I have about 15,000 subscribers on my email list um, and I use the newsletter plugin. And it's really powerful. It lets you, you know, do the drag and drop editor and everything, and and section out your 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 news your your, your subscribers just like a lot of the, the great tools out there do. Um, but for about fifty dollars a year, I pay for the paid version, which lets me send all my emails through Amazon's web services, um, and it's super cheap. So I can send fifteen thousand emails for about a dollar fifty, um, and that's. Uh, a crazy, much crazy lower price than say MailChimp and, and some of those other tools out there. Um, that being said, enticing visitors to subscribe to your, to your newsletter is, is really important. Um, there's two really great program, uh, WordPress plugins out there, Hustle and Optin Monster. Um, you've probably seen some of these where you can design pop-ups, uh, you can design you know, footer bars and you can design things in, in your sidebar widget and whatnot in order to entice people to subscribe. Um, I highly recommend use one of those if you're trying to build up your, your newsletter subscribers. Um, check them out, they're pretty cool. So in summary, I just wanna mention again that uh, SEO is all about the content and content and content and more backlinks and content and patience. You gotta have a lot of patience. Um, and plugins can help you speed up the annoying tasks, but they can't do the hard work for you, okay? Um, you have to create good content and you need to focus on affiliate programs that are right for your audience. And hopefully we covered that pretty well and keep your audience coming back with newsletters and social media.